Hi everyone, and welcome to another video. A while back, I asked my Patreon supporters to send me short melodies with chords from which I would discuss strategies for creating simple orchestral textures. This is sort of a preview of a future course that I'm working on. To me, it's where composition and orchestration overlap. I think a lot of times people separate the composition side of things from the orchestration process, which is of course perfectly fine to do, but as someone who's been doing this for quite a while, I found that it really helps to be thinking about the orchestrations early on in the compositional process. That doesn't necessarily mean figuring out all of the orchestration details at the beginning, but even simple things like having instruments in mind when you're coming up with melodies can be useful. In addition to the melody and chords, I asked my patrons to include a descriptive or expressive adjective or phrase that would help me in the orchestration process. One of my patrons, Michael, sent me this melody with the descriptive word majestically. I'll just play the melody with simple block chords in the piano. The descriptive word is really helpful here because it can inspire a particular timbre or rhythm or some other aspect to a potential orchestral texture. In this case, the word majestically made me think of brass, specifically of a solo horn. The word also makes me think of the word regal or royal, and from there I started experimenting with background rhythms in the accompaniment. But before I dive into orchestrating, I want to look at a moment in Sibelius's Second Symphony. I often look at an existing work or moment within a piece to get inspiration for orchestral textures. When first looking at the melody that Michael sent to me, I thought of this moment, thinking that maybe there's something I can take away from this. I'll play the excerpt first. This is in Dorico using Note Performer, by the way, but I'll add a link to a real performance of this in the descriptive box below the video. As far as orchestral textures go, this is fairly straightforward, and there's really only ever three things happening at any one time. A foreground, a middle ground, and a background layer. Those three layers are parts of the complete orchestral texture, but each individual layer may in fact be some sort of texture made up of a few different parts. Let's look at a reduced score view. I think this really shows what's happening here more clearly. You see now I have a four stave score, two treble clef staves, and two bass clef staves. I've labeled what instruments are playing each part of the texture. In measures one through four, there's a simple string melody in octaves, that's our foreground layer, then sustaining horns, clarinets, and bassoons, that's our background layer, and finally, this composite middle ground layer made up of three trombones plus a timpani playing an eighth note rhythm, and a tuba and double basses playing the downbeat sustain with a quarter note pickup into each measure. The background and middle ground layers repeat essentially the same thing through the entirety of this excerpt, only adjusting for harmonic changes. To me, this combination of low brass and timpani positioned with somewhat low chord voicings helps give it a majestic sound. It's simple, but strong. The background sustaining instruments are scored in the same octave as the middle ground, and timbrally it blends nicely behind the middle ground. The foreground moves from strings to trumpets and oboes to four horns, then back to strings. Even though the melody itself changes, there's a shared quality throughout the excerpt. To me, the foreground melody has a very confident and regal quality. I think it's the deliberate rhythms with the occasional dotted rhythm. Perhaps also that this melody is strengthened with either octaves, or in the case of the trumpet moment, with octaves and the fifth in between. So now that I've studied this orchestration, I feel inspired to come up with an orchestral texture of my own, using Michael's melody and chords. <laughs> 
I won't plagiarize or copy Sibelius exactly, but rather I'll use similar strategies to build my own texture that works specifically with the melody and chords. I'll make three different versions, one small, medium, and large, so three different scales. By that I mean number of instruments, overall density of orchestration, things like that. I'll start with the small scale orchestration. For this, I'm envisioning more solo instruments, maybe just one or two layers. I mentioned that solo horn came to mind early on, so let's see if that works. The starting note is a bit high, but still within the range of the horn, and the majority of the melody fits nicely in the medium-high part of the horn range that, to me, stylistically sounds majestic. Of course, if the melody note was a bit higher, I might have to transpose the passage down, but I think I'll stay in C major. For measures 4 to 5, there's a slightly awkward minor ninth interval that could potentially be difficult, especially for beginner to intermediate horn players. One potential solution would be to break this up between two different horn players. And another thought that popped into my mind was to have the first horn player resolve to the C a half step above, at which point I could have them drop out, or join the other horn in unison, or in octaves, or even create a harmonizing line or counterline underneath the top horn melody. In the version here, I'm having horn one drop out, then take the melody back in measure nine, and then both horns play the last four measures together in unison. So I suppose this would be the simplest form of orchestration for this theme, and I'm relying purely on the horn timbre to create that majestic sound. So even though there are two slightly unique parts here, there's really just one orchestral layer present. And even though this particular melody outlines and implies a good bit of the harmony, I can create an additional layer that is strictly harmonic support. Remember the background horns and woodwinds layer in the Sibelius excerpt? I'll do something similar here. First, I established some chord voicings that I'll use going forward. Even when I scale up the orchestration, I can base my voicings on this. I'm just following basic voice leading principles here, sticking to four independent voices. Although when you start orchestrating, the number of independent voices can change depending on how you double things up or down by octaves. Also notice that the harmony is entirely underneath the melody registrally. That was true in the Sibelius excerpt, but more importantly, this just worked better for me because of one particular moment right here. The melody note on the downbeat is the second scale degree, resolving up to the third scale degree. This sounds great even when the minor third is present on the downbeat position registrally lower, as it is here. It momentarily forms a major seventh interval with the melody, which is fine. It resolves then to the octave. This is pretty common voice leading. However, if you invert this, meaning the downbeat F would be above the melody note E, then you potentially run into some issues. Here's the same melody in chords, with the chords positioned entirely above the melody registrally. There's now this momentary dissonant minor ninth interval, and I think you'll hear that something sounds incorrect. It's not quite as harsh if we move the harmony down an octave, so instead of the chords positioned above the melody registrally, they're overlapping. This creates a minor second interval on the downbeat that resolves to unison. This is preferable to the minor ninth, although now you have harmony and melody competing in the same register, so you'd need to be more careful about timbres and dynamics when orchestrating. Another option would be to have the harmony mirror the melodic suspension from E to F. This removes the problematic interval, and the only potential downside is that it draws attention to the background, which may or may not be desired. And finally, another option would be to omit the F entirely above the melody registrally and have the harmony notes positioned above and below the melody. This happens to work nicely for the first inversion chord anyway, but naturally it results in a much fuller sounding chord voicing and texture which again, might not be what you want here. <laughs> 
Anyways, this was a bit of an aside, but I think it's an important one. Like I said, I'll stick to this configuration with harmony positioned below the melody. And in my first orchestration, I essentially copy those harmony notes into instruments. You could choose brass, strings, woodwinds, any of those would work fine, I think. I chose woodwinds, and that means that the horn melody will do most of the heavy lifting in making this sound majestic. I basically want the woodwinds to accomplish one thing here, and that is to provide harmonic support and to blend into the background. Bassoons and low clarinets are great for this. Here's what this sounds like. Notice that I waited to bring in the lowest octave in contrabassoons until the second half, just trying to give this passage some shape and development. But overall it's very simple, just two layers, a foreground and a background. Okay, on to the medium scaled orchestration. Now I have three distinct layers, a foreground melody and horns, background sustains and horns, trombones, tuba and contrabassoon, and a rhythmic layer and timpani. Looking closer at the foreground, I use a very similar configuration of horns as I did in the last version, though now I have four horns in total, at times I'm strengthening the melody at the octave, and at the end I actually have all four horns in unison. When you start adding a lot of brass backgrounds, especially trombones and trumpets, at higher dynamic levels, you really need to boost the horns, often through doubling. In the background, I've taken the same basic configuration of chord voicings from my last version, and placed them in low brass and contrabassoon. Contrabassoon is a really nice addition here because it can play those really low notes at a medium dynamic that in tuba would have a tendency to sound a bit too massive. The other significant change here is that on several occasions I've moved the starts of the trombone chords by a beat later. I think it helps it stand out while providing a bit more rhythmic variety and an overall more interesting texture. You don't want it to stand out too much, then it would distract from the melody, but I think it can get a bit boring if everyone is playing the same long sustaining rhythms throughout. By the way, I also have trumpets entering just at the end to give this climactic moment a bit more force and a bit of a brighter sound. Lastly, I added a timpani part that is somewhat independent. At times it definitely blends into the background, but I also wanted its presence to be felt because I thought that would go a long way in creating this majestic atmosphere. You have to be a bit careful when writing timpani parts not to go too crazy with note changes because they could potentially require the performer to tune the drums on the spot. Thankfully, modern timpanists can do this pretty quickly, but still, there's a point at which it becomes unidiomatic. I also think it's easy to overdo the timpani sound in your orchestration, so at times here I held back. You see there's a few measures of rest. Sometimes less is more here. Okay, let's hear this version in its entirety. to the large scale orchestration. Nothing too crazy or complex here, but I've added in more instruments, including a full string section. Apologies for not showing the MIDI view here. The score gets a bit too large for the screen, but you can find all of the MIDI files on my Patreon page if you're curious. Let's look first at the foreground. Similar to the Sibelius, I wanted to have the melody move around a bit more than in my previous versions, and also strengthened by octave doublings. So I start with forte horns, as I've done before, but I shift to octave strings in measure 5, then return to horns in measure 9, doubled by violas and celli, with full strings and even flutes entering in at the very end. Overall, the melodic timbre is shifting quite a bit more throughout, and I'm no longer just relying on the horn timbre for that majestic sound, although horns are still definitely contributing to it. In the backgrounds, like the Sibelius example, 
I have low woodwinds, horns, tuba, and strings at various points. I begin with low winds and double basses. Then when strings take over the melody, horns move into the background sustains. At measure nine, there's a brief climactic moment at which point I temporarily bring in the upper winds and trumpets, as well as high voiced violin chords. Likewise, at the very end, I bring in those instruments to increase the dramatic tension. Lastly, I've transformed that timpani part from my previous version into now a timpani and trombone rhythmic element inspired once again by Sibelius. The trombone chord voicings are similar to my previous version, only now the rhythms are closer to the timpani rhythms from before. This helps give the overall texture more motion and more forward momentum, and it gives it a richer overall sound. Let's hear this version. So I think that's it for this one. Three different orchestrations, small, medium, large. As always, there's a million ways to orchestrate any one piece of music. So what I've done here today is by no means the only way or the best way even, but hopefully I've shown an approach to creating some orchestral textures when all you have to start with are melody and chords. I'll be doing more of these videos soon. And the plan is to only use melodies that others have written for me. So I hope that my patrons will send me more examples soon. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it and see you next time.